<laughs> Hi, I'm very excited today to have Charles Hecker with me. He is a famous battlefield archaeologist and a uh, ni- uh, an amazing. See, I messed up. And an amazing <laughs> researcher. Uh, he's worked all over the Southwest, and we first worked together in Texas on the Battle of Palo Alto. Uh, Charles, welcome. I'll say Charlie now. Charlie, welcome to the <laughs> show. Just, thank you. Great. <laughs> Good to be here. <laughs> he's headed to, uh, could you uh, tell us a little bit about your archaeological background and how you got to where you are? Okay. Um, I uh, graduated from University of Georgia in 1973 with a bachelor's uh, with a specialty in, in anthropology, archaeology, and then uh, had a job in um, Virginia shortly thereafter, the Virginia Historical Commission, and I was also the uh, city archaeologist for Hampton, Virginia. And um, then I left there in 19. 19- 74 to go to Eastern Mexico University for my master's degree. And uh, there I graduated in 1976 and then returned briefly back to Georgia and worked for CRM work along the eastern seaboard and decided I really like New Mexico better. It's, uh, it's a lot drier climate and you can see the ground. <laughs> and I like green chili. So anyway, I, went, I returned and continued work in New Mexico and then in Colorado on a, a reservoir project, and uh, then came back to New Mexico in 1981 and did work around the state, worked for the highway department. So I became familiar, you know, all over the state of New Mexico uh, doing work uh, there. And then ultimately um, worked, I applied for a job. The, uh, it came up for um, a position or a temporary position to do the Battle of uh, Palo Alto, the archaeological work on that. And so I did that. And um, I really enjoyed it. It was fascinating work uh, out there and, um, you know, continued off and on over the years there as well. And then, of course, working with you on that great project. So uh, I've been involved with battlefield work after that and inserted myself where I could, working with Doug Scott at, uh, um, excuse me, at Little Bighorn. And uh, work at the battle, uh, I mean, battle, the massacre, Washita, or not Washita, excuse me, uh, Sand Creek Massacre site. And that we worked on that. And I've gone up there several times after that. And then I mentioned the, um, the Battle of the Washita, where that's also another um, Custer, uh, great, deb- no, whatever, debacle, if you will. Uh, so I've been involved in that. I got more interested in my area, uh, Apache research. Uh, because that's almost literally my backyard. We have Apache encampments not too far from Santa Fe and worked on those and worked with uh, Chris Adams, who's a archaeologist for the Gila National Forest. Okay. And he and I have been uh, working together since 1997 on a number of projects locating Apache encampment sites and uh, fight locations as well and involved in the Coronado uh, work on, on identifying uh, battle sites related to the Coronado expedition. So I was uh, in 2000 had become the archaeologist for the National Historic Landmarks Program for the uh, Intermountain region. It's from Montana to Texas. So um, I uh, had my I was allowed to get my program involved in doing research on 16th century uh, Spanish uh, entrada sites, specifically more, more on uh, uh, Coronado, and also worked in uh, Mexico too, as well. Well, that's fantastic. Um, what? Oh, oh, I just had a great question, but it just floated right <laughs> out of my head. <laughs> well, I wanted to, I'm really, uh, really excited to talk to you about, uh, Geronimo. You threw so many topics in there. I was like six or seven questions ahead. I was at Fort Pickens this morning when I woke uh-huh. up. So, uh, he was, oh, uh, Geronimo yeah. was held there for a little less than a year. Yeah. So I've been there too. I saw that. Yeah. So, so you actually, um, Used the metal detector technology, and you were actually able to find Apache camps that no one else had found. Yes, this this goes back. Uh, initially, it's doing uh, research that we knew a fight took place in this area. But when I say this area, it could cover who knows how many square miles. And reading the the soldiers themselves, you have only written accounts, of course, but they didn't really know as terra incognita for them. So you're going by. Uh, we traveled X number of days. We you know they they would have so many miles to a spring, and the spring may or may not have a name at that time where the spring name has changed. But in any event, what Chris and I have been doing since the 1970s, uh, excuse me, 1990s, 1997, is that uh, becoming familiar with the landforms, how the Apaches would use the landforms for defensive purposes. 
And it all depends, of course, where in the desert southwest you're talking about. In our area, say in, in southwestern New Mexico, uh, southeastern Arizona, you have uh, ridges and a r very rough terrain. And uh, the Apaches would have their encampments on the top of these ridges, but they'd always have an escape route. And um, they were very careful about not giving their position away uh, with smoke. So if there would be like in a saddle of a ridge, you would have generally some trees and there's some juniper. If any, that would might be where they would have there any campfire. So it would be dispersed by the trees. So we'd also be looking for any uh, culturally modified trees where limbs had been cut off with hatchets and lichen has grown over it. So we know it had been cut a long time ago. So we knew we were approaching an Apache encampment. And often as not, um, there would be no physical evidence, no surface, uh, superficial evidence of you know, artifacts, but we would simply would do a metal detecting sweep. And it's a really amazing how many often that uh, it'd be a nondescript ridge and you do find this, you do find uh, remnants. And they really are using a lot of metal. Uh, there's this attitude belief that, well, the, you know, Indians by and large didn't use metal. I don't know how that has gotten to that form. They love metal, boy, I tell you. And um, you would find uh, sometimes the arrow points themselves, metal points made out of, of, of say, a barrel hoop and be chiseled into shape and filed. And uh, then you'd find something, not the arrow points, you'd find the scrap for making the arrow points, plus other detritus that is an ind indication of an Apache encampment, um, something called, it's a piece of a Mexican bridle called a coscojo, it's a jingle. And you'd have a series of these on, on the bit. And uh, often not, you'd find those. And you actually find those in Plains Indian camps as well. But uh, you'd find those in some other objects. And, and one campsite that we found in the Florida Mountains in New Mexico, in the extreme, it's near the boot hill, um, uh, we found a wikiup, which is a structure that the it was grass uh, structure with bent uh, uh, limbs. But it was actually using a living tree. And they used the bough of this ancient. Uh, juniper there as part of it, and then uh, would have the branch. The branches are still there, plus a stone pestle up in the still resting in the crook of, of, of the branches. There it was, and we found all along in there material from their deep raids into Mexico, uh, just from the dates of the 18th century. So uh, was, it was it was was really uh, really great. It was we're not we were not looking for that site. In fact, we were looking for an 1877 fight somewhere in the Floridas, which we never found. But we found a lot of evidence of this being a str Apache stronghold from at least of the 17th century and up in, well, um, you know, we, we had Victorio in that area. That's, that he was uh, used, that was one of his strongholds. So uh, we found evidence where miners in that area had stacked up rocks to defend themselves from Apache attacks. And we, you know, found their cartridge cases and arrow points. And we can only guess whatever happened to those miners, but uh, may not have been very nice. So, but no, that's uh, what we've been doing is looking at the landform and reading, reading landform and uh, doing it from that approach. Not always does it work, but the uh, nice thing is that um, Athabascans in general, Apaches, although they come back to the same area, they would never put uh, the wikiups in the same location. They would go to another ridge or another place. So that kind of helps us out a bit too, because they, although they're not, there are really not that many Apaches, relatively speaking. Um, it was estimated that in the early 1830s, at the height of their power, there may have been maybe 8,000 Apache men, women, and children, and they were essentially controlling an area the size of modern-day Germany. And I'm, I'm not exaggerating. There was uh, there during that period, and also Comanches were coming into northern Mexico as well. And you'd have a uh, whole, you know, um, haciendas were shutting down, villages, people were leaving. It was everything boarded up. They controlled that area, and you'd have raids deep into Mexico, up into Chihuahua City. And uh, and would be gone, you know, and bring back their loot. So and and this is uh, and the Comanches actually um, sh should note this is very important fact. The Comanches drove the Apaches out of uh, western Texas in the early 1700s. The Apaches were fearing for their lives, and the Comanches were hunting them down. And so keep that in mind. The Comanches were were basically the the badass dudes in that area. Right. So right. yeah. <laughs> That's in that book, the uh, People of the Autumn. Uh, yes, and it's, it's, I have some other books over here on the Comanche. There's some excellent reading on that. Yeah, so yeah. Well, uh, let's uh, you know, let's try to get into the movies. We talked uh, briefly uh -huh. before about uh, some mm -hmm. Geronimo movies, and uh, right. you, you told me to look up one that was the the worst Geronimo movie ever. Well, this is my 
it's actually the Buffalo Soldiers. I don't like that. That was a Ted Turner one. And oh, there's, okay. there's, oh, yeah, I, I, okay. I, it, it's, um, if you're, you're familiar with that movie, it was, uh, of course, a Ted Turner uh, production. And the, the premise being that the Buffalo Soldiers who are chasing uh, Apaches, actually, um, Victoria, which in the time period that was already anachronistic, Victoria was already killed. But the point being is that they ultimately found that, that we have something in common with the, with the Apaches and that we are, um, you know, we should be, you know, we empathize with your situation. In point of fact, the Buffalo Soldiers were soldiers. We we perhaps over romanticize it, not to by no means denigrate what they're doing. I'm fascinating with that. I'm working on that. But they were professionals and they had a job to do and they did it under incredibly harsh situations. There was no situation of, of uh, you know, prisoners that they were, you know, uh, there, there's nothing like that that happened. I just, yeah. uh, Could you say what the Buffalo Soldiers are just in case our audience oh, doesn't sorry. know? Yeah, that's a term that was, we don't really know the origins of it. Uh, but uh, in 1867, uh, black uh, uh, men were, uh, African-Americans were enlisted in the 9th and 10th Cavalry and the 24th and 25th Infantries, and they were in uh, in, the, in the West. And they were termed, as a one theory is, that the Indians being of their hair reminded them of, of the uh, buffalo, of being that kind of, uh, that kind of, you know, the hair being, of that, and that's why you referred to it. And the, the other idea is that they were, it was a remark of uh, respect which for them, which I imagine they did, but they, you know, once again, um, the Apaches, Comanche, they, they uh, understood the uh, the troops, the U.S. troops they were chasing and whatever. They, uh, although they could run circles around them, they did respect them uh, to a sense. But by by God, they're protecting their own homeland, and they're going to kill them pretty ruthlessly if they had to. I mean, and there's enough incidents of that. But that that was a point that I found uh, objectionable about that. I think it was a little bit too much political correctness there, and I think it did a, a, a disservice actually to both. I think so too. Most of these uh, men were former slaves, and many of them exactly. fought in the All Civil War. Was, yeah, yeah. And uh, but they uh, about their background, they were put in the uh, areas that were they were not really. Uh, and it was brought out in that movie. I, I will give them credit for that. Could not go into a into the towns. They would get, get, get killed. Or in one instance, the uh, one person, a uh, black troop, was beaten up, and the other troops came in and shot the place up. I mean, there was a basis of that. But they were put in areas that were. Uh, really put to, to fight Apaches. Now, they're also the 3rd and 6th Cavalry white troops did the same thing too. But I, I should also mention in this Buffalo, so on this campsite, this very large campsite that uh, we record, is about 75 acres in size. All their, You can see their, uh, their, uh, their rings for campfires where they laid out their tent pads. Those uh, troops uh, white tro also use that area as well. And it wasn't segregated. Uh, I, I think oh, we can't really there, there and that's uh, you can't really tell a distinction between what the black troops had and white because everyone had the same stuff. No, I mean, just it, it makes sense. You have white officers, of course, in charge of the black troops, but they don't want to get their <laughs> killed. They want their men uh, equipped like everything. So that that that's a um, has been brought up by a few historians who I won't say, but um, that's wrong. They were given the same uh, equipment. Now, the equipment in the late 1860s, early 70s was not very good. It was Civil War material, and it was really not meant to be used in that rough environment. It was not until the mid-1870s that the Army finally got around the idea to uh, equipping the soldiers with uh, improved firearms, uh, uniforms, etc. The U.S., uh, the, the Congress, in its infinite wisdom, thought we had our warehouses bulging with all the Civil War material. It'll last us into the 1920s. That was their yeah. intent. Can you imagine? And but anyway, they they uh, the, the troops were as equipped as best they could. Uh, right. Some were equipped better because, uh, say, the Seventh Cavalry, because they're generally, and I don't think they were given any special uh, consideration. But they are often is not located at the head of where their uh, their, their trains had come in. The area brought in uh, supplies. They're more they're better supplied in some respects. But but uh, you have those out in Texas, whatever you have. Uh, uh, you know, all those equipment had to be come in on wagon trains, and um, and the soldiers simply could not bring in a lot when they were bivouacking. Really, just basics. Right. So, okay. well, let me ask you about a couple of other movies. Now, I know we talked about uh, uh, Geronimo with uh, with the rifleman Chuck uh, Chuck Connors. Yeah, Chuck Connors. 
with a blue eyed uh, uh, yeah. Geronimo. <laughs> Well, I, I had a black and white TV. So I, yeah. I didn't know. But I, what can you do? Well, they did that in a couple of movies. The uh, the um, yeah. the uh, bad Indian, I think his name was Scar in uh, Stagecoach, the famous John Wayne movie. He had he had yeah. blue eyes also, and so oh. they they have a habit of casting uh, uh, Indians with blue well, eyes in some of these well, movies. Well, the thing is, they're not going to be casting. It was. Rel- relatively few Indians actually got significant roles in Hollywood, right? Right. Uh, I mean, uh, Jay Silverheels is possibly the first one that comes to mind. And some, you, you know others. Um, I'll tell you one that I think is actually pretty good is Ozana's Raid. Okay. Burt Lancaster, 1972. Oh. Right, right. And that's right. it's very good. Uh, and I think the portrayal of um, well, um, Burt Lancaster, who, his character was basically the wizened, knowledgeable uh, frontiersman. And uh, then you have the young lieutenant out chasing down the individual Ozana, who's probably, I think it's based loosely on Nane, who I can talk about. And that was, sorry, 1880s. But I think it was very well portrayed the idea of how Apaches fought. They were not interested in, in, in glorious charges, et cetera, et cetera. That's bull. Uh, their intent was to defeat their enemy annihilate them possible with, with but with absolutely as few or no casualties of their own because in fact you may win your victory but if you lost one of your brave you're not going to become brought back in great honor it was important because they had so few anyway you know it was especially in the 1870s they're they being pursued pretty hot, hot pursuit they there there was uh, so yeah that, that, that but that was pretty much i think how it was shown in Alzana's raiders how an ambush would be done um, other ones you heard me <laughs> mention about it, uh, you know, a little pet peeve was just Stagecoach, which is a great movie in one respect. I just thought it did it injustice to Apaches up on that uh, narrow gorge or press or whatever, firing down as a stagecoach goes through, and all they do is perforate the luggage on top. That ain't how it does. And, and I know that John Ford said if he'd – yeah, I know the Apaches could have killed the horses, but then again, I wouldn't have a movie, and I understand – you have to keep that in mind, and I like the movie for other reasons. You know, that's that's just. Well, you uh, we'll talk about it again uh, when we sum up and everything. But you're uh, the, it's a perfect model for asymmetric warfare, and we could have yeah. learned so much, you know, without learning it uh, the hard way. <laughs> I guess we'd well, already learned it once. Why do we have to learn it again? Well, it's interesting about asymmetric warfare was not taught at West Point. Our the, uh, how they're the. the the cadets were taught in the 19th century based on the French uh, ideal. That was their idea, not British, because, of course, we hated the British still. Right. But it was the French was considered, and then Napoleon was considered the best. Our, our tactics, whatever, is based on that. Our, even our uniforms with the Kepi, the Civil War, you know, was all French, French influence. But um, the officers that were stationed in the West, once again, you know, learning it the hard way. They didn't pat necessarily pass it on. If they survived, you didn't have, although undoubtedly it happened, uh, but you had to learn it the hard way. And, and, and there was great, uh, a needless loss of life as a result of, uh, just to give you an example, uh, uh, a, a favorite trick of an Apache band in, in southeastern New Mexico would be to um, ride up fairly close to a, um, a cavalry unit, maybe 20 guys, and get them to chase them. Well, the Apaches horses are very wiry, you know, their ponies, they could eat just about any damn thing uh, and survive on very little and very, very tough. The, uh, and um, the um, soldiers horses were, you know, grain fed heavier and but they didn't have, frankly, the stamina. So uh, the Apaches, you know, they couldn't catch the Apaches. So the guys would go back to get water for the horses. And guess where it was at the watering hole it was another band of Apaches. And they were attacked. this happened three times in the space of about six months. I mean, I mean, come on. <laughs> it's sort of that's what I'm talking about. They could play. They they were saying, use classic thing. You know the weaknesses, your own own weaknesses, your strengths, and you play. You try to neutralize the weakness of of your opponent, and that's an of asymmetric warfare. That's the classic aspect of it. And the Apaches had been uh, masters of this um, since first encountering the Spanish in the you know the 1600s, if not earlier. Uh, that's what they were doing, and they were uh, keeping the Spanish very well at bay for for several hundred years. And the you know the Americans only won because they ironically they they got uh, Apache scouts to locate the hostile Apache bands, 
And the other terrible irony, as you know, is that uh, when Geronimo finally surrendered, guess who went on the uh, rail car to uh, Fort Pickens? It was those Apache scouts. I always thought it was a great one-act play of the conversation in that damn cattle car as they were heading east. <laughs> you should write <laughs> that up. 30 went in, only 10 came out. <laughs> Yeah, so everybody was just grouped in once they didn't need them anymore. They didn't need them anymore, exactly. Like we did in Afghanistan, but that's another story. But, you know, that's what we do. It's, a, it's the same pattern over and over. Yeah, we do. We do it over again. Yeah. Did uh, you get a chance to uh, anything familiarize yourself with Geronimo, the American legend, the one with Wes Studi in it? Um, uh, yes, uh, I, read, I, I watched that in 1993. That was... That has one anachronism after another. Uh, you have characters in there that had did have no play or you know they're. Uh, I, I mean, it bothered me. I, I happened to watch it uh, in a matinee with uh, two Park Service historians, uh, and uh, they were worse. I mean, they they knew more than I did. But the one guy was uh, Neil Mangum, who was, had been the historian at Little Bighorn, and uh, he was just going down the line how this was just wrong, 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 wrong. And people behind us were telling us to basically shut up. <laughs> it was ruining for us. But that was, I mean, West Duty's a great actor. And and I, I mean, I, uh, you know, like and Last of the Mohicans, I thought that was pretty darn good. But I'm afraid I'm, I'm not a, that was not good. He's a, uh, uh, West Duty played a good Magua in that movie, but I was actually watched the one where Bruce Cabot, the old John Wayne drinking buddy. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. I, played that yeah. character. And he was uh -huh. really good. It's like, I don't know, it's like 1925 or something. And he actually did a really yeah, solid really job. Good. But but uh, Wes Duty, he, he, he's he got one scary face. I mean, yeah, he, by that Ir Iroquois lot, whatever, that was just fierce as all get out. No, that's, no, that, that's a good, I, I think that's, that's, a, that's a good one. Yeah. So that, I talked with uh, Julie Shalitsky. Yeah, and, Shalitsky, uh, yeah. Yeah, and she made that point about you know how how much it enhances the movies by actually casting you know the right ethnic mixes uh, well, for that makes, the background. Makes sense, yeah, it sure does. Yeah, and so so um, let's see, we're up around about twenty five minutes, so we're doing good. And what I want <laughs> what I want to do is, uh, Charlie, can you tell me what you uh, you've already done a little bit of it? What else are you working on? I know you have a new book coming out, and I'd like you to tell us about that. Well, I am actually, it's a, uh, it's a chapter in the book. It's on uh, the archaeology of asymmetric warfare. Uh, it'll be coming out this June, uh, University of Alabama Press. And uh, my focus uh, is on, uh, well, Apaches, but I start really in Mexico because you can't just start, a, I mean, there, there are origins of any, anything. And what was the origin of asymmetric warfare is how it was fought in the West really starts in the northern uh, half of, of Mexico. And uh, the uh, you know the um, the familiar with the, the well start with the Aztecs, but uh, you start with uh, the the asymmetric warfare that was going on in the early 1500s in Mexico. It was quite remarkable in some respects of what we were do uh, was being fought in Vietnam as far as search and destroy missions. Uh, Spanish very stripped down to the very basics to find uh, a village, go in and, and kill the chiefs and uh, burn everything, bring back captives, because that was the only way they can get money for this is having the slaves. But a lot of these <laughs> didn't work out for them. They were, as many of those guys were killed too, and they're not all Spanish. Uh, it was interesting too. There's aspects of it where you have on the frontier, it was a melding of different cultures on the frontier, barring from each other. And you would actually would have uh, the, the, the Spanish were picking up on uh, guerrilla warfare as practiced by the Indians, the Indians are picking up how the Spanish conducted their tactics, and they borrowed from each other, and it was pretty horrendous. I mean, it, was, it, was, it was a very vicious war, and that went on for centuries, and it pushed right up into northern Mexico. Uh, remember the, 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 the Chichimec War of, uh, from you know, 1547 or 1590? Uh, that was um, on a far greater scale than actually of, of the bloodshed that was going on with the Apaches later on. But uh, the same idea of how do you uh, – setting ambush sites – um, the, uh, the Chichimec learned how to use the horse instead of eating it, they learned how to ride it. Right. They learned how to use the arquebus. They learned how to use the swords. They would actually, uh, dress in, in, in captured Spanish, uh, clothing, whatever, and ride up in quasi as if they were Spanish and they were allowed in to a, uh, a little fortress. And then of course they were inside and Iroquois did the same thing too. 
by the way, 1700s. So, I mean, this is the aspect of it is the, uh, uh, frankly, it's, it's, it's a denigration of, of Native Americans as far as they were, uh, were not clever enough to learn. It was inevitable that the, uh, you know, Spanish, then, you know, Euro-Americans were going to win. But, and what I want to bring out, or what I, I hope I have done in my chapter, is that, that in, in many places that the Native Americans could check for a while, and def- or even defeat, uh, the encroachments. And it was just a matter of the, the sheer push of numbers, and um, that's ultimately what, what caused it. But for, you know, 350, 400 years, it's quite remarkable feat. And, and basically, our our U.S. military, it's interesting, as uh, of our idea of, of tactics, of strategy, of fighting in, in asymmetric warfare, finds its roots in fighting uh, Apaches, that uh, you have staff rides that go out uh, to uh, uh, Apache Pass, fought in 1862, and just how uh, Cochise uh, managed to bottle up a, uh, you know, a, a company for two days who even had howitzers. But how this was done, but you know, they're teaching these young second lieutenants who are going to go off to Afghanistan. And this country, this area, is just like rugged, like Afghanistan. And saying, "Where do you think someone is right now?" Could be, you, you know, you got a bead on you right now, and you can't tell. It's just jumbled, and it's the vegetation is such you can blend into that. And that's what they teach these young men, uh, basically, on the Apache War. Okay, well, that, I'm going to put a link to your book, to the book, in here, okay. and when we do this. And uh, definitely, I'd say I can't wait till it gets out. But it kind of it's some some stuff that I've heard at um, uh, Horseshoe Bend, the same kind of thing. Yeah, the, the the Native Americans had been pretty successful for a couple of hundred years, holding on to their core area, you know, and they would lose a battle here or there, but it would work out that they could still maintain it until Jackson kind of double crossed them, they were holding <laughs> it together. You yeah. know? So, so it's yeah, a, well, that's some was, interesting uh, parallels. So that was, no, that, that's, a, that's an interesting, the whole uh, aspect of that warfare in the late 1700s, early 1800s, what was going on there. But there, there were, uh, the Indians were trekking west. You know, they were, they were getting the hell out of it. Uh, you know, they had, uh, you know, Comanche, or not Comanche, the Cheyenne. Ultimately, they, you know, they were from Minnesota. And there's still a, a, a large group in Minnesota at that time. But they are, uh, the, the Cheyenne were actually Great Lakes uh, Indians, and, and they started moving out. In the late 1700s, being pushed up because of the encroachments, and that's um, that was that was their only way to survive. They they adapted really well. Of course, they learned from the other uh, tribes there. Uh, but you know that's a, that's a remarkable story in itself. Yeah, that uh, is adaptation uh, really quickly over a very a, a whole horse culture in, in the Great Plains. Well, let me ask you this: uh, the final question really is, uh, what have I forgotten to ask you? What do I need to ask you that I haven't asked you? <laughs> oh, that's, that's I wish you prepared me for this. I, I don't. Okay, let me. I'm going to change the subject. There is another topic. Okay. I'm getting away from movies and from what I've been doing. Apaches mentioned Chris Adams, archaeologist for the Gila National Forest. Uh, Chris uh, has been using Militech for over 30 years. He, I mean, he was a kid, but um, in his uh, work in the uh, uh, the the Gila wilderness, or in the wilderness, not Gila, but in the um, the Membrace wilderness area, um, he was uh, he would check out uh, uh, Apache wiki uprings. But in one of these places, he was getting uh, copper nuggets, raw copper nuggets. And he says, "Well, that's curious. What's going on here?" And he noted that there was a, a little Membrace site right next to a little pueblo, three or four room. But he found this on uh, some months later, same situation, Apache and uh, pueblo, and he. Uh, the little light bulb went on and says, well, maybe this is associated with the Membrace people, who their, their culture collapsed right uh, mid-12th century. Uh, are they collecting these up? Well, he and I, I started helping with this, and we were going out to a uh, um, very small uh, Pueblo uh, Membrace sites and finding uh, a great deal of, of, of copper nuggets. They're picking them up. There's a, right now, there's an open pit uh, copper mine near uh, in Silver City. In, in New Mexico, so unfortunately, all that surface material is gone, but they were picking it up and they were actually use, doing metallurgy with it. They're making bells, copper bells with it. It's not oh, coming from yeah. Mexico. The membrane, the Indians, they were making themselves. And in fact, they may have been in fra- trading them to the uh, Puchteca uh, traders that would come up from you know, prehistoric. From the tin. So um, also scraping out the um, 
the the, the mineral, the uh, color like malachite, whatever, and using it for paint. And you find that for, uh, for, for finding that too. So uh, I just I put in a plug here for what Chris is doing. Uh, he's found uh, now, I think, up to 27 membrane sites that have copper, 100, uh, uh, I think, uh, copper bells. Uh, we found tubular beads, copper tubular beads now on, you know, on white sands in that area. Uh, so uh, we're doing, um, um, you know, x ray fluorescence. On, we're, we're trying to identify the sourcing of the copper. Actually, uh, uh, lead isotope analysis, really, because you can't get that off of uh, X-ray fluorescence. But um, that's what we're trying to do is sourcing now the, the copper for this. And it could be that uh, we, we think it could very well be that this is a trade item with the Chaco people, that no one's ever used really? a metal detector. What, who uses a metal detector in a prehistoric Pueblo, right? right. You no, know, because it would, no one thinks of metallurgy. With that. But now you have uh, the Membrace people are – using it for at least you know, 100, 200 years, and no one, our archaeologists never, if you don't think of it to look for it, you're not going to find it. They probably, right. in their screening, flipping off all that little pieces of rocks and that some of that stuff was actually copper or whatever. So um, I just want to put a plug in for that for that kind of a work, that, that this is what we're finding now using a metal detector and thinking outside the box. Y'all are really uh, putting some new uh, information down with what you've been doing out there. It's pretty exciting. We're using the PXRF on the cow pens and trying to yeah. source oh, you the are, different yeah. combatants. And, yeah, yeah. And it's an exciting time in archaeology right now. It sure is. It sure is. God. Yeah. I wish I, I would love to have gone back to some of the sites I recorded 40 years ago and what I what I <laughs> could have found. By it, but we didn't have the technology. If we'd have just so, known. We'd only know. <laughs> yeah. Well, Charlie, it's great talking to you. And I think we could uh, do three or four hours of tape here. <laughs> well, no problem. Uh, you have some fascinating stories, and I really appreciate you taking the time, and I uh, hope I everybody this. will like this. 